So you will hear more about it. We just want to announce that the fifty dollars at the chamber, the oyster roast, that is November the third. I'd like to introduce a special person to me, who is my boss. So today is Farm Bureau Insurance. I told Brent, I said, I can't get up there and talk about myself. So, you know, in life you have leaders. You have leaders. And they come in and out of your life various times. And at Farm Bureau, uh, they often say, why do you call a boss? He's really a manager. Well, I'm born in Joanna, textile mill, so you refer to it as boss man. But, you know, when you got a manager, they can step on your toes without even messing up the shine on your shoes, then you got somebody that's ready to leave you. Brent Brannells will come to speak to you now on behalf of Farm Bureau Insurance, just like Pastor Mike did, First Presbyterian. But at Farm Bureau, our motto helping you is what we do best. And we have a tremendous leader from our agricultural side to our insurance side. And he is a Richard Wynn Eagle. So the Crusaders took out the Eagles, right? Well, he's going to let you know. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Farm Bureau, our county manager, Brent Brown. I was asking Bud if I could talk about this microphone. He said, I don't think so. Uh, but Bud may not be able to talk about himself, uh, but I don't get a chance in, in front of him uh, in many situations uh, to, to thank him publicly. So I would like to do that. I know uh, that you all know how much energy and, and effort Bud puts into uh, athletics in Lawrence County. Uh, and I promise you that I get to see double that energy every day in Farm Bureau. Uh, Bud has led our company from a sales side of things going on two years now, but more importantly to me, he leads it on the service side, which is taking care of our, our insurers and the people that do business with him. Uh, so Bud, I thank you very much for that. Uh, I was nervous enough until uh, before Buddy got up here and told everybody I was a Richard Wynn Academy graduate. <laughs> uh, but that is true. I, I, I played ball and football at Richard Wynn Academy uh, in the late 90s and then came on and Tried to play ball at PC a little bit before my football career ended with the dislocated hip. Um, just quickly, uh, I'm not a big speaker, but I do want to say a few words. Uh, I'm very thankful uh, and grateful that Farm Bureau can be a part of the Touchdown Club. Uh, they're just a tremendous organization to, to recognize young athletes um, who um, you know, go out every day and, and do what others don't, and put in extra work and, and try to accomplish things. Um, a lot of people will say football is just a game or, or sports is just a game, and I think that probably the people in this room know that it's a lot more than that. Um, looking back in, in my time of playing sports, some of the most valuable lessons I learned were on the athletic field, and some of the most influential people in my life to this day are the coaches uh, that, that are with me. So with that being said, I'd like to thank you coaches for the time that you put in uh, to develop these, these young guys and the young adults, uh, and also just thank you to the athletes, the cheerleaders, the, the football players. Uh, you know, one thing I'll challenge you to do, they always say one thing that successful people do that others don't, um, is it, they accept the challenge. They, they learn how, life doesn't get easier, uh, we, learn, we learn how to handle the hard better. Uh, so just challenge yourself every day to, to certainly be the best that you can do and, and uh, use your God-given abilities uh, uh, to do that. Um, with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Bud. Again, just thank you so much for having us, for letting Farm Bureau be a part of this. Uh, and congratulations to, to all the players and coaches and cheerleaders that are here today. Thank you. What we'd like to do now is get our report. Look forward to hear what the uh, Red Devils and the Raiders and the Crusaders done. We always want to start, though, with our Presbyterian College Blue Hose and Coach Eagle Hart. So at this time, Coach, I'm going to give you the mic. You don't need it. Okay. <laughs> Coach Engelhart of the Presbyterian College Blue Hose. Give me a big So quickly, uh, we, had a, uh, we had a tough loss last week, uh, hard fought. Uh, really proud of our kids, the way they, they fought uh, for 60 minutes. Unfortunately, we didn't start off real well and uh, kind of dug ourselves a little bit of hole. We couldn't quite get back to it. So we lost 14 to 10 uh, up at Moorhead State. Uh, like I said, I thought our, our kids fought extremely hard, and, and we're getting better every week. Uh, I think we're learning to handle the hard, you know, a little bit, a little bit better each uh, each and every week. 
Uh, we had a, a, a couple, I think, a, well, I'll just say this, a, a couple uh, bounces go our way and, and we win that football game, but, uh, we're, but we're getting there. We've got a, another tough one, a conference opponent this week versus Valparaiso at home <laughs> at 12 o'clock. So uh, at Bailey Memorial Stadium, we, we hope that you all can make it uh, to that game at 12 and, and we'll put up a, a great fight and hopefully come out uh, with a win this week. I brought four players with me uh, this week. And uh, I'll start off, I brought two offensive players and two defensive players. Uh, first off, Clint Podwell. Stand up. All right, he's an offensive lineman uh, for us from Lake City, uh, South Carolina. Uh, is a redshirt sophomore. Uh, does, does a great job for us as one of our leaders on the offensive line. And, and uh, he's moved around a little bit. Uh, he's going to play a little left tackle this week. And uh, he's been playing right tackle, so we're trying to mix things up a little bit and get a little more production from offense. But what's your Business and engineering is his major. Uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about all these guys, and actually uh, all these guys do a great job in our community, uh, getting out into the community, community service. Uh, they've been going to elementary schools and uh, helping out with uh, them and, and reading to those kids and things like that. So uh, actually all of them have done that. So uh, they, they, they all do a great job with that. Uh, Patch Bennett is our, our next uh, offensive lineman. He's a, he's a true sophomore. He is from uh, Georgia, from uh, Pierce County High School uh, in Georgia, and uh, you know, also a great job. He's our center, uh, tough kid, uh, really, really works hard. Uh, once again, is a leader. Got guys that are going to help this program continue to grow. He knows that I have a lot of uh, older guys that I've ever brought, mostly freshmen and sophomore. What's your major? Oh, business management. Business management is his major. All right. Next up is uh, defensive lineman Anthony Dye. Uh, Anthony Dye is from Gastonia, uh, North Carolina, and uh, he, he's done a great job for us continuing to, to grow. He's a redshirt uh, sophomore as well, and uh, he's continuing to grow. He's got a couple sacks on the year and, and continuing to uh, get better at the defensive line position. He's going to be a leader for us again in the future as well. Uh, next up is uh, Eric Say, or Eric C. Sorry, I always say Say. Eric C. Uh, he's a, a corner for us. Uh, he's, he's done a great job. Had a pick this past weekend that really kind of got us rolling uh, in the second half and gave us some, uh, a little bit of momentum. Uh, he's done a, done a really great job. Uh, he is from Decatur, Georgia. What's your major? And, uh, business is his major. Uh, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, and, and I, don't, I don't really, didn't really want to do this, but I, but I got to because I'm so proud of him. Uh, you know, earlier in the year, uh, you know, 18 to 20 year old kids, right, they make mistakes. And uh, earlier in the year, he, we had a, just a small, not a big deal, small discipline issue uh, from him. And I decided to suspend him for a game, for one of our home games. And this man, he handled it like a man. And uh, it really makes me emotional because not everybody can do that uh, in, these, in these times, in these days. And they don't accept the consequences very well. And this young man did. Um, and he, he owned it like a, like a real man would, would own it. And he was nothing but a team player uh, that entire week. And, uh, and I think he's grown from it. And I'm really proud of him for that. So I just wanted to embarrass him a little bit about that. But uh, he, he's going to be a bright star for us uh, in the future as well. So. This year we have our Players of the Week, the Farm Bureau Insurance. I'm proud that Brent's here because, um, guys, y'all think when I, you talk here me about Farm Bureau Insurance, the Forest of Football, I've actually brought the man today that made this happen. And so with that said, it is time to honor our Players of the Week. So I'm going to turn it over to our Touchdown Club President, Gene Simmons. Thank you. I'm going to embarrass Patch Bennett as well. Any Georgia Bulldog fans, this is a side note. Any Georgia Bulldog fans in here besides Brent? Patch, tell them where you're from. Oh, Pierce County High School. Blackshear, Black Georgia. Black Georgia. Stetson Bennett, the quarterback, is from his hometown anyway. But if there's no one for Patch Bennett, not Stetson Bennett. Uh, Patch, <laughs> right? Not, not Stetson Bennett, not the mailman. But anyway, our Farm Bureau insurance players of the game. A couple of weeks, as we mentioned again, I can't thank. Farm Bureau Insurance enough, and Brent and Buddy and their team. You know, we give these football collectibles now, so we're very proud of that. We're proud of you folks. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. And September 23rd game, a couple of weeks ago, it was running back Jaden Robinson. Jaden, Brent, if you and Buddy would come up. Jaden Robinson from Clinton High School.
Clinton High School had a 54 to 28 win over South Aiken High School. This young man had five carries for 121 yards and excuse me, two touchdowns. Had touchdown runs of 15 yards and a long touchdown run of 66 yards. To do the math, that's 24.2 yards per carry. Coach Fountain, who you'll leave to him, but Robinson is an awesome young man who practices as hard as he plays. He's a great leader and representative of Red Devil football. Our September 23rd player of the week, Jaden Robinson, Clinton High School. For last week's game, of course, I think all high school games were moved up. One of the close up games, anyway. Some played on Wednesday most, as Lawrence and Clinton did. And Lawrence County played on a Wednesday. Lawrence High School and Clinton High School played on Thursday the 29th. <clears throat> but our high school player of the game for that game is Bryson James of Clinton High School. Bryson, please come forward. This gentleman right here, number 25, had five carries to 70 yards and two touchdowns. One for five yards, one for 32 yards. That's an average of 14 yards per carry. Also, in kickoff returns, he had a 90-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. His third of the year. On defense, he had 3.5 tackles, two tackles for a loss. He excels on special teams as well. He had one block punt and one calls fumble on the guy that was trying to punt as well. Both of those led directly to touchdowns as well, so he attributed three directly, two indirectly. Bryson James, our player of the week. <laughs> Coach Fountain, again, alluded to him. One quick quote from Coach Fountain. He says, Bryson gets after it in all phases of the game. He's a positive leader as well as showing others his way through his worst work ethic and his effort. Again, Bryson James. Thank you all. I said this last week when Jordan won about how, you know, you can hear him, him and Jameer Darwin, by the way, and you can hear these guys, but I'm going to tell you, one of the hardest licks, and it may be the hardest, we give every Friday night, okay, the hit of the game, and when Bryson James hit that punter, we said, just tear up the ballots, it's over, nobody's going to hit nobody harder than that. You had to see that. The young man, and I'm not making fun of the young man, I hope he's okay, but his helmet come off, and Bryson hit him at the hashes, and his helmet went all the way to the numbers. Well, if you look at the film, and I've seen it, and I haven't got a chance to think at Bryson about this, but he instinctively thought the helmet was the ball, and he was going to go after the ball, but it was the helmet. But the Red Devils did get it, and I'm telling you what, ladies and gentlemen, um, I may be a Red Devil, but that young man right there is a football player. And the other young man sitting beside him, Jane Robinson, is only a junior. Barry Sanders S. That's what I'm going to tell you about Jane Robinson. He reminds me of Barry Sanders, the way he knows football. Proud of you guys. Proud of Farm Bureau for our Touchdown Club Players of the Week. But that said, we're going to turn it over to Coach Darrell Smith. I put pressure on him last week. I said they will win the region. Well, they want to know. The Raiders are one and up. It's good to be here to be able to recognize these players uh, every other week. And, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we played T. O'Hanna. Didn't go as well as we wanted to. Very tough team. They, they probably have as many seniors as we have players on our team. So it's just a time to, you know, especially towards this time of year, looking at our, uh, you know, future. And the good thing about uh, right now is we have about 40 freshmen on our team that have been coming every day and practicing every day. So that looks really good for the future. We're seeing some of them guys and our numbers increasing. So we're hoping to keep that trend moving in that direction. And then, um, you know, last week, uh, Playing uh, Greer, you know, knew they were going to be a tough team. It was going to be a tough game. These guys really responded. Uh, you know, the Greer got out a little bit early, and then uh, really the fourth quarter, just saw a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, even though we were down. And these guys uh, really brought it, and uh, you know, touchdown, two field goals there in the last eight minutes to put us ahead by three. And it's just exciting to see how they just fight. It's kind of what they've been doing all season long. 
is not worried about the last play, just play the next play, and they continue to do that and, uh, you know, get off to a great start in the region. And uh, we have uh, Riverside this week, which is going to be, you know, another tough test. They're, they're probably doing a little thing different, but they're probably just as tough a contest as uh, Greer was. And uh, just brought some guys with me today. Uh, Isaac Adams uh, plays center for us. And, you know, had some limited play time last year because of the injury, but has really come on this year. Uh, uh, extremely talented offensive line. Got the size, uh, got the footwork, and just got the toughness to be an offensive lineman. And everything kind of starts with him being our center, and he's just done a great job all year long. So, guys, guys. And Jordan introduced him to become just a habit, I guess, we do it becomes a lot of things. Got nominated for a lot of things. Uh, he's done a great job for two years. And uh, and this being his senior year, he, he's done a great job on defense. And I've said this about him many times, is he is kind of a complete linebacker. I mean, I coached a lot of them. That's kind of that's the position I've coached. Uh, and seen a lot of them, but he, he plays the runner extremely well. Sometimes you get a guy to play the runner real well, it's real physical. But they may lack in pass coverage. Okay, well he does. He, he plays pass coverage just as well. And then he's also a great open field tackle, which to me is probably the hardest thing in football to do. But he can get the guy down one on one in space. And he's done a great job on defense for us. And then uh, this week he actually came out uh, first drive of the second half to keep us in the game. We we put him at running back and. Uh, and they did a great job. We marched down the field and scored in the first drive of the second half to kind of keep us in the game. So, and then special teams wise, he's our long snapper, short snapper, does a great job with that. So, he's really helped us in all three plays and done a good job all season. Hey, Jordan Roberts. <laughs> Gage, I'm going to say Gage for last, so stand up, Gage, because he made one of the Probably one of the best plays all season long that nobody noticed. And uh, just a backstory on that is we've had uh, Jordan's our start long snapper, and we had a backup long snapper, and, and and Gage was coming out there, and he had a knack for it, so we let him, you know, want him to keep doing it. So he did it for the last six weeks in our pre-practice. He went out and he was long snapping, practicing for six weeks. You know, and you third guy, you don't think you're going to get in much, but he took he took it seriously. And uh, then it came uh, Greer in the third quarter. We are in our punting out of our own end zone, down 10, I think down 10 at the time. And that game could have, and, and Jordan tweaked his ankle for a few plays, so it wasn't ever going long snap. Gage went in long snap, threw it back there perfectly, and we were able to punt it out of there. And after that, we got a, a turnover and a field goal like that. So that, that play really changed the game. It could, we could be feeling a lot different today at that one play, uh, not half the way it did. He did a great job, and it's kind of what we talk about football all the time. You work for that opportunity, you work for that opportunity. Gage got his opportunity, and he took advantage of it. He was able to help his teammates be successful, and just, you know, one of, the, one of those plays a lot of people don't recognize is what we should be. It's Gage Sellers. Up next, I'm going to ask Coach Fountain to stand up and he has talked, give us our Red Devil report. Red Devil 7 0. Got a bye week. That's something not happening a lot in Clemens, South Carolina. But this is head coach Corey Fountain. Just uh, want to say thankful to be a, a football coach um, and to coach these young men and, uh, and to see the progress. Uh, got a lot of guys that are seniors here have been with me for four years and you see the progress and it's not always easy. It's not always easy. Sometimes you're flying high, sometimes you're flying low, sometimes you gotta get out up off the ground. But my first year, just looking back, you know, we've had some big wins, but just looking back and reflecting this week as we have a bye week and looking at the progress and it's because young men uh, were committed uh, to getting better and committed to working and uh, they were committed to us and trusted us and we trusted them and we're moving forward from there because that first year was tough. We were the ones getting handed the 50 something uh, whatever losses. We, we were getting uh, stomped in the ground lots of times, but you know, as uh, Martin Luther King Jr. says, if you can't fly, you run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl, but you keep moving forward. And uh, that's what these group of young men have done. And uh, we want to continue to do and set that precedent 
uh, for the younger guys. And I think the guys that came before that stuck it out, that didn't quit that year, you know, they've already gone on and graduated. But when we were getting our brains beat in, but they stuck with it and they saw them working it and it sets a precedent for the younger guys to stick with it, not leave, not quit. And uh, that's what football is all about. And um, I've got some good young men here that I want to introduce to you. Um, Eric Robinson, defensive lineman, senior, stand up. Um, unsung hero, he's on the D-line, getting double teamed, um, just getting buried in the ground. Some games he felt like in the South Dayton game, that's kind of what it felt like. But in the last game versus Union, uh, you know, he was able to be one of our leading tacklers. Uh, quiet kid, just comes out and does what he's supposed to do. Never says a whole lot, Eric Robinson. Uh, Jaden Robinson, uh, we spoke of him earlier, um, player of the game or player of the week in the South Dayton game. Uh, this young man uh, on JV didn't even get to play much. Didn't really come off the bench that much on JV. Uh, his freshman year. His sophomore year, we used him on uh, varsity. Uh, special teams guy, just played every snap on special teams, got after it, worked hard, kept working in the weight room, filled in on the um, room game your uh, sophomore year where uh, you were leading rusher, caught ball, so he filled in, he did his job when he came in, and now one of our leaders on offense. Just uh, unselfish kid who if he needs to block, he's blocking until the um, whistle blows. Uh, at practice every day asking questions. He asked so many questions when we were freshmen. We were like, man, are we ever getting him on the field? Like, he asked question after every play. But you know, that's how you learn. And uh, he kept getting better, and, uh, and he's doing great things right now, uh, Jaden Robinson. Bryson <laughs> James is a senior. You hear about all, all the time. He, you know, you feel, they're like, well, he's already been a player. I'm like, look, man. You, you know, you got to reward him when you when you do awesome things. You don't you don't just keep putting him to the side. He, he keeps doing awesome things, and it's not just at running back. It's not just on defense. I mean, he plays every snap of the game. He only comes off the field on PAT. That is the only thing I think he comes off the field on. And it's not just him running the ball. He's laying blocks for these other guys to run the ball. He's making tackles on kickoff. He's making he's blocking punts. He's blocking PATs. He's flying all over the place. And you got to reward a kid like that. I remember him speaking of uh, when he was a freshman. We took him to River. We took him, took him all to River Bluff. You know, it was my first year. We took him to River Bluff to scrimmage. It was a four-way scrimmage. There was no breaks. We brought our JV team. Half my JV team was crying. Coach, I can't go anymore. I'm tired. It's hot. I had three guys sitting over there with no pads on. He was the last back. He's like, Coach, I can't do it. He'll, he'll lie. He'll say he didn't cry. But he was crying. He was crying. Coach, I can't. Tears coming out of his eyes. My stomach hurts. No, you get back in there. And you know that, you know, they learn how to take their knocks and stuff at, at an early age, and then they just kept working to get better. But awesome young man, too, in the classroom, in the community, always smiling, always offering a helping hand. Um, just a, a pleasure to coach and a uh, pleasure to teach, and, and look forward to awesome things from Bryson James. <laughs> Nazi, also a quiet guy. You never know he was there. Um, he barely smiles. He only, I only see him smile at football practice or in games. He'll see he didn't smile. I said, I told you, he does not smile. But I, I think he's a, a happy kid inside. But he just doesn't show a lot of emotions. Uh, but he gets after it on the football field uh, every play. Um, on defense, he, he's and on special teams, just an awesome young man. Um, maybe we can teach him to be more of a vocal leader next year as he becomes a senior. But he's a junior. We get to have him for one more year. Uh, nice bird. Same this the last right here, Coach Travis Plow. Good afternoon. Happy to be here. Obviously, last week was a very odd week with the hurricane situation. We had to move our game to Wednesday, which I believe that was the first time we ever played on Wednesday in our school's history. So we had two days of prep. I would take the blame for some of the way we played on Wednesday. I don't think I did a good job of getting this ready to go. And uh, probably had too much confusion in the game plan. We only had, only had two days of prep. The young football team did go very well for us. And I'm glad at this point we've got a bye week. Uh, I told our guys I'm not really interested in us getting necessarily um, resting and, and all that kind of stuff this week. We've got to get better. We've got stuff to fix. And if we don't get better, uh, we're not going to finish the season very well. And we've got a very important game coming up on uh, the 14th against W.W. King. And so our, our goal this week is to correct all mistakes, get better, and be very prepared for that crucial region game we have in two weeks. So obviously, I've done something a little bit different. I brought some young ladies with me uh, that give a lot to our football program, uh, starting with our cheerleading captains. 
Stella Smith and Emily Whiteford. I think we have 17 cheerleaders, so obviously I couldn't bring them all. I'd create a problem, and I didn't want to do that. So I brought the captains, and our cheerleaders do a wonderful job of bringing a lot of energy. They told me not to use the word spirit. I don't know what it's that about, um, but they do bring a lot of spirit as well. Uh, our pep rallies are uh, pretty crazy, probably because the Tarvers are in charge of them, and they're from Joanna, so we can expect a little bit of craziness there. Um, so uh, our pep rallies, we get people ready to go and ready to play on Friday night. They have a lot of energy. Um, the, the noise level uh, is, it can be, honestly, I want to walk out of the gym sometimes because we have being uh, in our situation with K4 through fifth grade also in, in the gym. You know, these new voices just go crazy. Uh, but when, when they're finished, you know, we're ready to roll. They also uh, decorate during the week and uh, do a great job with banners. Most of my banner ideas get vetoed because they're not appropriate. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. I keep in mind. But I, I really appreciate them and cheerleaders and what they do for us. Then I have four managers. I have Madison Sherman, Olivia Hawk, Henry Suttles, and Riley Ballard. And since ninth grade, they have been managers on our team. They're now all juniors. I don't know what I'll do in another year. That's going to be a problem I'll have to uh, deal with. Uh, they also said that calls water girls. I don't know what that's about either. But um, they uh, provide a lot of help on Friday nights and being able to keep us properly hydrated. Um, uh, also, uh, they deal with game balls, teams, everything like that. They're very well organized. Uh, Madison, Emily, Olivia, not only are they helping us uh, in football on Friday nights, but they're also on our volleyball team that is 18-4, first place in our region. And so, like last week, they played Tuesday night. They came down Wednesday night. Um, I think somebody skipped. I won't bring that up. They came down Wednesday night to uh, help us uh, play against Faith, and then they're playing again on Thursday night. So they're very dedicated, and I really appreciate what they provide for our government. Thank you. Rolling right along here, we get into it. Um, probably, as you can tell, I'm a little extra excited today because our speaker is someone very near and dear to me. Uh, tremendous friend, colleague, and everything. But before he comes, uh, we have a special thing. First Presbyterian Church of Lawrence. You heard Pastor McCracken speak to King Dixon. You know, a member of that church, leader in that church, deacon in that church, probably served every position and on behalf of Mr. King Dixon who meant so much to Lawrence High School to this Lawrence County Touchdown Club to the city of Lawrence to the county of Lawrence we've asked the most qualified person in the room to kind of give a tribute today in honor of First Friends of Church of Lawrence being our game day sponsor a legend in his own right Mr. Herb Adams who started this Touchdown Club he put the numbers on KC Hanna Stadium. Him and Mr. King Dixon side by side have done so much. So at this time, a living legend to honor King Dixon, Mr. Herb Adams.
entering that third grade that year, he met a young girl by the name of Justin Mason. 1959, King graduated from the University of South Carolina, cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. He was a recipient of what is called the Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award, the highest award given to the graduating senior. It's given to the male to see that award. No? Okay. Did you not hear me? Okay. Well, I'll talk loud enough anyway. But anyway, the re female recipient of that award was Augusta Mason. Within a matter of months, certainly maybe weeks, Augusta Mason became Augusta Mason Dixon. And she had been married in the first grade of Freedom Church in 1959. And that was a couple that exemplifies to all of us what marriage should be about. In the intervening years, between 1945 and 2006-19-2020, a powerful life of honor who was always faithful was released by God on our county, our state, our nation and our world. At YMCA camp in, in Greenville, Camp Greenville, there's a motto. King was very active in the YMCA all of his life, in camp every year. And that motto says, don't wait until you're a man to be great. Be a great boy. So to you athletes, I, I say that's, that's something you all about. You don't have to wait one minute to be great. Just do it now. King was great, there's no doubt about it. He was the uh, president of the student body at Lawrence High School. He was the letterman for four years, football, basketball, track. He held the record for the state in the 100-yard dash as a senior. And then he led a he added baseball to it in junior senior year. He then went on to Carolina and played uh, three years. He didn't play as a freshman. So he played as a sophomore. He started all three years. At Lawrence High School, his junior year, he scored 153 points. His senior year, he scored 143 points. He got up to the advertising at the time, said they thought that record would never be broken. I don't know. Maybe they had <coughs> But I know then, they didn't have the playoffs. He played the 10 game schedule, and that was it. In addition to that, you didn't just play it. Offense, a defense, a special team. He played them all. The king was a defensive back as well as he was a running back. And he did a great job at, at all of those. In this county, I don't know anything that he was not involved in. He was involved in, of course, he mentioned the Touchdown Club, the YMCA, the Chamber of Commerce, the Economic Development of our county. He was very unselfish. But King loved to laugh at himself. He didn't take himself seriously. I was just telling the crowd over here at the Lawrence High Table. As a uh, senior at Carolina, he returned to punt in the University of Texas. 98 yards. It was a record at the University for many, many years. It was the opening kickoff. Carolina was a visiting team dressed in all white. And uh, he broke loose, felt a twitch in his leg. He thought maybe he'd pull a muscle. And got down to about the 30 yard line, he got the clear field, and he was going to score. Ladies, you got to excuse this. Said Alex Hawkins ran up behind him and said, King, you done missed in your pants, boy. <laughs> <laughs> he loved to tell that story because of his truth. <laughs> but, he said he went straight to the dressing room. <laughs> but he, he, he liked to, I guess just to say, laugh at himself. But he accomplished a lot of things. It's amazing. One thing that he accomplished that not many people know or have much to say about the Olympic champion in the 100 yard meter, 100 meter dash at that time was a guy named Dave Sun. Dave was a Duke. Uh, athlete was a record holder in the 100. 
they came to Carolina for a dual meet. We used to do those kind of things. You can't beat them. So that, that's just amazing. He, he, uh, the thing, though, that he did for the university, the alumnus, I appreciate this, and know why I appreciate it very much. It's, he was the AD when we got in the SEC. If you don't know what that means, we were a member of Metro, and our revenue from Metro Conference at that time was $50,000 a year. We went into the SEC the first year we were there, bought it twenty million dollars I figured it out the other day and looked at it. What the SEC has meant to the University of South Carolina would be like us having just about a billion dollars and I was told by our professor who spent it yesterday that when Texas and that's nice the budget for athletics is about 135. So that comes back to King and I, I laugh because through the years, you know Carolina job budget. We can't get in trouble, we can't do anything. <laughs> One problem is, so many people won't take credit for it. And you can go ask 10 people at Carroll, <coughs> who's responsible for you being in the SEC? They're going to say the general president, the chairman of the board trustees, all this kind of stuff. But in 2015, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of being in the SEC. And we had a banquet honoring that occasion. King was coming to the banquet. But that afternoon they had a press conference. And King didn't come to the press conference. Roy Kramer, the commissioner of the SEC, we got in. Asked to see one person. He didn't ask for the president. He didn't ask for the chairman. He said, where is King Dixon? King Dixon, we all know has been a lot to us, a lifelong friend, said of King, he not only did the big things, he did the small things. He was a homeward and Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. I know this South Carolina graduate, this big game cop fan, had no problem honoring King Dixon. No doubt at all. Chris Bergen is our feature speaker. He was supposed to be here last year, but the COVID's kind of stepped in. He wasn't able to be here. So this gentleman right here has a great distinction in this county. I don't think of many people, Michael Seaboard today, he quickly let me know. He said he, he remembers it. Our feature speaker today is the only man that has the distinction in this county of being the voice of the Presbyterian College Blue Hose, the voice of the Thornwell Saints, the voice of the Lawrence Academy Crusaders, the voice of the Lawrence District 55 Raiders, and the voice of the Clemen Red Devils. He did every single one of them. He started the most popular show in Clemen, which is Saturday Morning Rewind, you wake up in Clinton and you listen to Saturday Morning Rewind. That's what you do. Coach Fountain told me two, two uh, games in. He said, more people listen to this show. I said, Coach, how you know people tell you? He said, no, you tell them to blow these horns and they blow them. <laughs> this man right here started it all. Right now, he's went on to bigger and better things. He's the current co-host of South Carolina Sports Talk. Right there with his co-host, Phil Cornblow. Many times just hosted on his on a member of the Coastal Carolina Chanticleers broadcast group serves as their play-by-play -play announcer for basketball or sideline analyst for football. He does play-by-play -play for Soccer City High School. He's also done it for Lake City High School, the Florence Red Bulls. So this man really knows what to do when he gets behind a microphone. And I can tell you right now that to Mr. Sandy and Miss Rhonda, I will always be grateful that you gave me the opportunity that you gave me. I would never not acknowledge you because I love you both that much. But this man right here went out of his way. 
I'm telling you, the most genuine, the most gracious person that I personally know. He literally stepped aside while he was voice read to us and put these on. Put them on right now. And he stayed in that press box with me. He told me what I was doing wrong. Sometimes what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to say. He taught me what you're not supposed to say. The etiquette when you go to Greer, when you go to Woodruff, when you go to you, exactly how to do it. Not Daniel, though. <laughs> Daniel put you outside there in the, in the middle of the stand. But all that, I'm going to tell you who he's married to. Former Miss Heidi Zeiser of Ormond Beach, Florida, who was a 1998 Clemson Tiger graduate. I stick it to him every time there. She's currently the sports medicine coordinator for McLeod Sports Medicine in Florence. Heidi has done well. And yes, he had to be married. His ceremony in the Botanical Gardens of Clemson University. There it was. But I just want to say this to you right now. Coming to you tonight is a man, it would not surprise me at any time that ESPN gets to call and anybody gets to call. This man right here can do it about as good as anybody I know. Please welcome to the podium, Chris Bergen. how in the world I'm supposed to follow that, but I am so grateful to be here and so honored for you folks to have me here. Lawrence County, I didn't grow up here, but my radio career grew up here. And Coach, just for you, because uh, Coach Nichols saw me come in with my coastal gear, and I was thinking this morning, all right, if I wear some Gamecock stuff, I'm going to upset half the people in the room, including the guy who's going to introduce me. If I wear some Clemson stuff, I'd have to dig into my wife's closet and upset myself. <laughs> so I thought, all right, I'll go neutral and I'll wear my coastal stuff. And first thing Coach Nichols told me, you're in the wrong stuff. I was thinking, why? I had forgotten that several years ago in the Big South, Coastal and PC were rivals. So in honor of that, Coach, I'll take off. Hey! <laughs> it's not quite PC blue, but close enough. But uh, really, I'm really Really excited to be here. I am. Clint Caldwell, good to see you. Buddy mentioned that I did Lake City football. I actually broadcasted Clint's games when he was at Lake City. Coach, you got to go. He was a beast at Lake City High School, so uh, really, really good to see him. But, you know, I mentioned my broadcast career sort of started here in Lawrence County. First team I ever worked for when I got out of college, I went to work at WLBG. And so I was doing Lawrence High School football. That was my first radio gig, and I thought I'd made it. It was a big time. Coming out of college, you guys are going to find this out soon. You guys will learn as you move along. You can't be told anything. You know what? So I listened to all the great radio announcers. I knew how to call football. We're going to be a problem. I'll step behind the mic and I'll handle Lawrence and we'll do a great job. So I get maybe the second game in doing Lawrence High School. And Bobby Ivey gives me a call after the game. And back in the mid-90s here in town, I don't know if they still have public access here in Lawrence County or not. They used to replay the, the high school games, also the PC's games during the week. Well, they would add the radio broadcast to those games. And so the coaches enjoyed that because they got to hear what stupid stuff we would say about their teams. <laughs> so I got a call from Coach Ivy, and I'm thinking I'm doing a really good job. And he said, would you mind coming by the office one day next week? I, I think I might be able to help you. I'm thinking, all right, that's good. He must think I'm doing a great job. The game prior to that, Lawrence started tandem quarterbacks. One was left-handed, the other was right-handed. I didn't realize that they were changing quarterbacks every series. So about the third series in, I made the comment, man, it's amazing. Lawrence is moving to football with a quarterback who's ambidextrous. <laughs> <laughs> so, so coach called me up and said, mm, we need to talk about a few things. Taught me great lessons. And if you've ever worked with me, and Buddy can tell you this is true, any of my broadcast partners, Sandy Crookshanks included, I've never looked at them during the broadcast. I always keep my eyes on the field. And Lawrence High School is the reason for that. Because I did not notice that they were shuttling in quarterbacks. You know, when you know everything, you don't need to be told anything. So, but I'm very grateful to Bobby Ivey and, and Lawrence High School. And Clinton High School got to call state championship games with you guys. And Daniel references the upper state finals when Duke Hopkins was playing for Daniel. Daniel didn't have enough room in the press box that year in the upper state finals because TV was there too. And as we've learned over the years, TV is what it wants. Radio has to take everything else. So Buddy and myself and Jimmy Webb and all our broadcast guys, we're sitting outside on the table 
top deck of the Daniel sidelines in 20 degree weather maybe. <laughs> Clinton picks off a pass in the last 30 seconds to seal the, uh, the win going to the state championship game. I wasn't sure we were going to get out of Daniel because I'm going nuts. Jimmy's going nuts, but he's down on the field. We can't even hear him. We don't have his mic turned off. I can see him jumping up and down. So, uh, Lawrence Kelly has been a, a lot to me, and I, I'm really grateful to come back and see all you folks. And, you know, my career has taken some interesting paths over the years. Been Presbyterian for a long time, and then PC moved on, left the radio station, moved to Florence, where I live now. And working actually with Sports Talk, and I can do the show from Florence. All I need is a laptop and a microphone. Radio wasn't like that when I first got started. I mean, we used cassette tapes. You guys know what a cassette tape is? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I wasn't sure if, if the high school guys or even college guys anymore know what cassette tapes are, but we would replay the Thornwell broadcast on WPCC on Saturday mornings. Right after Saturday morning, rewind the clinic broadcast. So, but I've, I've been fortunate to work with now Coastal Carolina. I've been working with them for about 13 years and sort of morphed. Over the, over the years from starting with women's basketball. I actually started doing women's basketball when I was still living here in Clinton. It's a two and a half hour drive to Conway from here one way. I would commute back and forth so I could be on the air with Miss Crookshanks at six o'clock the following morning on a Thursday. But it was something I felt I needed to do for my career. And one thing I've learned about radio, and guys, it, it can translate to any job you're in, is change is inevitable. But growth is, growth is something, if you, if you want it, growth is option. And so over the years, I've tried to make sure if I get an opportunity to take it. PC was a great opportunity for me. Sandy gave me the first chance to do some college stuff. It was awesome. Coastal has been extremely good to me, more so than I deserve. I've got a national championship ring from baseball. I've got a Sunbelt Conference title ring at home. Also have a uh, Cure Bowl ring from last year when they won the Cure Bowl. I didn't do a thing for them. <laughs> they, they, they did all that stuff without me. But it, it, it's been a, a joy and a privilege to be in radio now for about 30 years. But this is where it started. And I'm ever grateful to Emil Finley and the staff of WLBG and Sandy and Ronnie Crookshanks, Strox, so good to see you guys, and everybody at PC. Coach Eagle Hart, glad to have you in, in the family now. And the Clinton High School coaches, Andy B, was there at the time, by Ivy and Lawrence. Todd Kirk over at Lawrence Academy. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on and on of people. I could stand up here for another 20, 30 minutes just to thank people for allowing me to get where I am. And so every every weeknight, if you're bored and you know, want to hear some sports talk, we're on the air six to eight on WLBG. <coughs> sports talk and really enjoy doing that as much as I do the play-by-play -play side of things. But Buddy said, and this is the one thing I wanted to do instead of giving a long, drawn-out speech. I wanted to actually talk with you. So if you have questions about what I've done, what we do at Sports Talk, maybe in particular, how the Gamecocks are going to do at Kentucky this weekend. Clemson's already won the Atlantic. Don't let Buddy tell you otherwise. <laughs> they, they won the Atlantic last Saturday. Now they just have to go through the rest of the uh, rest of the schedule. But I'd love to hear from you guys for a few minutes. If you've got questions about what I've done, I'd, I'd love to chat with you because I'm, I'm so grateful to what you have given to me in my career. I'm going to ask the first question because these guys all want to be recruited, and I know that's a big part of your job on Sports Talk. Recruiting and NIL, everything that's happened now. So, with the guys listening to you and the coaches also, Coach Smith, Coach Fountain, you know, recruiting, what is your opinion of exactly how it stands in 2022 for college? Well, even with the NIL situation, they managed to like that the transfer portal. First thing, Coach Engelhardt can tell you for sure, when they go out and recruit, the first person they talk to is not the, your football coach. Guys, they're not going to go to Coach Fountain. They're not going to go to Coach Smith. They're not going to go look around here. They're going to go to your guidance counselor, your principal, because they want to find out what kind of young man you are, what your grades are first. Because if you can't get into PC, there's no reason for Coach and his staff to be over there to recruit you. So take care of the academics. I know that gets pushed to the side because everything, everything is now focused on name, image, and likeness. In your mind, Coach, bigger change in college athletics, name, image, and likeness, and transfer uh, Name, image, and likeness. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the transfer portal is huge, and it, it gives a lot of uh, leeway and options for, for kids now. But uh, name, image, and likeness is whoever handles that going forward in the future will be 
There are schools, two in our state in particular, USC and Clemson both, that are setting up offices just to handle name, image, and likeness. That's their only job. When they're recruiting kids, they want to make sure they've got a plan for you guys when you come on campus. Hey, we're recruiting you as an offensive lineman. We're recruiting you as a wide receiver. Here's how you fit. Oh, and by the way, Bojangles has an opportunity for you here. Dempsey's Pizza has an opportunity for you here. And all of this stuff is laid out. It's, it's an entirely different world. And I've actually heard Jamie Chadwell, who's the head coach in Coastal Carolina, he was talking on his press conference last week about the transfer portal. And one thing he mentioned, at the FBS level, 50% of quarterbacks now are transfer kids. So guys, the only thing I did, it goes back to change is that inevitable and growth is optional. Go to a school that you feel you fit. Use that, it doesn't matter whether it's Division Three, Division One, Division Two. Go to some place you feel comfortable, where you fit. And if it doesn't work, you have the luxury, which most students you know, 15, 20 years ago did not have. You've got the luxury of transferring out without a penalty which makes you much like the best of your fellow students at whatever university or college you choose. But the transfer portal at NIL in particular, buddy, to answer your question, made recruiting so much different. That's why I'm glad I'm not Phil, because Phil Cornblue handles all the recruiting in the state, I don't have to deal with it. I do have to read it on the case. <laughs> but good question. Conference affiliation, Power 5, atmosphere, that is going to change again? Got to. I just don't see how we stay where we are. I mean, with Oklahoma and Texas coming into the SEC, probably in two years, the Big Ten's already making its moves. I think we're headed towards a situation where there will be two mega conferences in, at the Power Five level, for lack of a better term, because that's what everybody knows. And I think you're going to run into a situation where schools like Coastal Carolina and the Sun Belt and some of those other mid-major conferences are going to be in an extremely good position to sort of Move, maneuver up because I think they positioned themselves nicely, especially at Sun Belt. Coastal came in back in 2017. They followed Appalachian State and Georgia Southern. Since Marshall's been brought in, Old Dominion's coming in, James Madison is in, and Southern Mississippi. It's a 14 team league that actually has, Gene, to your point, actually has regional affiliation. You know, from West Virginia all the way down to uh, Mississippi and Louisiana. So, but I, I just don't see a way around it because of the amount of money that's being pumped in, especially at the major level, that we're not going to get in situation where there's probably two major conferences. The, the SEC and the ACC probably will merge at some point in time. The Big Ten will get to Pac-12, and then the Big, Big 12's going to have to figure out what's left. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Dutton? Chris, when, with all of this integration, if there's just two big conferences, my question is, how is there enough success to please the people who are given every square dime of their school. If you're USC and the SEC and the ACC, whatever it is, you're not going to win that conference but once every 20 years. How can you just, to me there's not enough glory to go around when everything is centralized. Well, um, to Carolina's points, I hate to do this, but they've not won it since they joined back in, you know, in 92. They do have an East Division championship, but you're right. Uh, with the more teams coming in, it's going to get considerably more difficult. And the, the greater question to that is, Mike, if you're a Gamecock Club member or an MTA member, do you want to give your money directly to the athletic departments or back to the name, image, and likeness? Would you like to get involved with those collectives that are starting to prop up so you're directly influencing the student athletes on the field? I mean, to, to me, that's the bigger flaw in the system is you're asking hardworking people, especially in the economy that's where it is right now, coming off the pandemic, to give away their money directly to the school like they've always been doing, or do they look at it and say, you know what, I want more Spencer Rattlers or DJ Uyama Lays here on campus, so how can I help Clemson and South Carolina do that? Let me give to that, and season tickets and all that stuff, I can live without as long as my team wins. So I don't know where, where this is going to go and how you're going to be able to compensate for the lack of success. But I do know this, there's enough money still, as we see it every day, that college athletics are not going away, and especially college football. Anybody else? Come on, I'm going to come up here about once every 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, I, I just want to thank you all 
uh, for allowing me to come and speak today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Like I said, Lawrence County, I didn't grow up here, but my radio career was born here. And so I'm very grateful to you folks who enjoyed seeing you all. And uh, best of luck to everybody. Um, and quick piece of advice, Coach, I've seen Dylan, when you meet them in the state championship game, get all you can in the first half. They're a really good second half team, so just put that in your hip pocket. And good luck to you guys, and thanks again. Listen, I've got up here brag about all the advice that you give me. Let me give you some advice. Never talk to Corey Fountain except for one week a year. He don't look past one week. Amen. I know where they're headed. Amen.